It is just a huge honor today to have Larry Emmett come down. Thank we, you, Howard. We both live in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, my gosh, it's been so fun practicing in the same town as you for 30 years. So basically, um, Larry is one of the most entertaining speakers in dentistry. He has presented hundreds of talks to dental groups across the U.S. and Canada, and since 2003 has led an annual three-day CE adventure course, Technology on the Rocks in Arizona. He's also a part-time mountain bike tour guide. That's right. That is amazing. Uh, recognized as a leading dental high-tech authority in the country with over 30 years of experience as a practicing general dentist in Phoenix, Arizona, Dr. Larry Emmett's mission is to help dentists make good technology choices. He has written three books on using technology in the dental office and is a featured contributor to the ADA book, Expert Business Strategies. He has contributed hundreds of articles to dental publications. He has been a pioneer in online publishing with his blog, EmmettOnTechnology.com, and has been recognized as one of the top 10 dentists in social media, no doubt. So, Larry, the bottom line is, uh, the, the bottom line is um, these kids come out of school $350,000 in debt. And if they just bought a hundred and forty thousand dollar Serac machine and a hundred thousand dollar CBCT and an eighty thousand dollar laser, three choices, they just doubled their student loan debt. And what I uh, so basically, what technology has a return on investment? Well, I think the the first. Oh, by the way, before I jump any further, you read my uh, introduction very well. Thank you. And when I do that to like most dentists, it's right. But when I say the most entertaining speaker in dentistry, well. I'm one of, one of the you know, really most entertaining speakers in dentistry is Howard. I'd love to hear him talk. And I said a pioneer in online publishing, which is true, but Howard really is the pioneer. So, you know, back, I don't know if you even remember, do you remember a guy named David Dodell? Does that name mean Absolutely. anything to you? Absolutely, in Phoenix. He teaches you know, at Midwestern. Yeah, so the real pioneer. So back in the day, before the internet was really a thing, David Dodell, who really is the biggest geek in dentistry, had this sharing thing. We were exchanging emails around the country, and all of a sudden I went, oh my gosh, we can like exchange information around the world, and we can do this. And I started my little my blog and my email and kind of stuff, and then Howard steps in and with what's become Foran Media and just took this idea and just ran with it. So, well, David uh, Dodell, on the David Dodell started the Internet Dental Forum. Right, IDF. And, um, and there was... Uh, um, I met, I think the first dentist I met online was Michael Barr on a, um, God, what was it, a Comcast email group? Do you remember Mike Barr? Yeah, they had these uh, email groups. Yeah, uh, that's what we groups. did in the day. But, but what, like, uh, but, but what, what uh, finished it off for me was um, was the um, Roots. Remember Roots? Um, Roots ZX, that was just okay. ended honest. And if you just lied and said you're an ended honest, you, know, you could get in. I, I've only been kicked out of one CE class in my entire life. And it was in uh, San San Diego. It was uh, Gary Carr, and it was ended on us only. So me and Mike Tola said, "Well, we'll just check that we're ended on us." So everything was going good. We did the morning class in the afternoon. And then right near, right when he walks by, some guy's talking to me. He goes, uh, "Well, Howard, you're you're a general dentist." And, and he fed Gary Carr found out, and he just lost it. And the Tola and I <laughs> just cracked up, and uh, we said, "Okay, we'll just go to the bar early." And uh, but it was, uh, um, but but what I didn't like about those is you would um you'd get to work and open up your email and oh my god there'd be one thousand oh, yeah and then here's what was disheartening for me um somebody would get on and say how do you how do you do this on a root canal or how do you how do you do this and everybody would passionately answer it but they the emails they're just no um you know they're just flying by and then like a month later a new guy joins asks the same question and everybody's like god we just yeah, there's Talk no archive. Yeah. yeah, there's no yeah. archive. So it was the beginning days. And like I so, said, what I, I admire what you did because you took what I was kind of poking at and David Dodell launched in a very early stage and made it professional. And so I admire what you did. You kind of took what we started. Well, he, we, David, started. I, I hung on and made it into something really... Well, big. I mean, let's so, be technical, though. I mean, Al Gore invented the whole thing. <laughs> we, just, we just rode his wave. Um, but what I liked about um, the message board is I didn't want my own email box polluted. And I also noticed... Yeah. Real early on, back in the day, that um, people didn't like spammed emails. They, oh. they, you're, you're, when you open up your email, you want to see the one. Uh, like, like yesterday, my my mom got mad at me because I didn't answer her email. Well, hell, I had three hundred emails. I didn't say yeah. mom was three hundred yeah. down. Um, but um, so I just wanted it to be at a separate website and organize. And what we see on Dental Town now, it's a very interesting behavior. I mean, there's uh, with five million posts, how many questions can you ask? So if you had a question like broken MB2 file, if you went to Endo or just search MB, broken MB2 file, 
I mean, there's so many threads and pictures. I mean, I don't even know what new questions so, you can ask. And I think what we're pointing out here, too, is because I've been doing this for 40 years. When I started, it was like BC before computer, you know, it was yeah. a completely different era. And so we've seen these amazing changes and the, the evolution of that communication from this little uh, email serve, which was just an incredible thing, to then what you did with Dental Town, and as you've seen it evolve, because Dental Town's been around for what now, 20 years? Since 98, 19 yeah. years? Yeah, so, and uh, that's evolved amazingly. So we're just, and we're, I think we're still seeing changes. We're still seeing changes. The, the In fact, when does Dental Town get another article from you? Because we got a new feature on Dental Town, and it's so cool. You know, in dentistry, the, the greatest gift a patient gives is a referral or a friend or loved one. And I think uh, all of our articles have been written for free since 1994. It's actually when we started in 94, the magazine. And uh, we just added the internet in 98. But now we have a feature that um, when you have, when you're reading the magazine online, it's got a share button to your social media. So your Facebook, your Twitter. And that has exploded uh, the um, readership of the online magazine because um, now these articles, we've just been doing yeah. it for a couple months. But almost every article I looked this morning, almost every article has like 50 to 125 shares. And that's the Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and then, you know, the average person right. on Facebook. Just might, think, yeah, well, that does have all the power of the internet and how that yeah. expands what we do. Which, let me get back to your question, because it kind of, well, it kind yeah. of comes, because some of this has become full circle, kind of answers some of those questions. Because, because what we're doing with that, because think about what we did. So in the olden days, really olden days, BC before computer, I had a little study <laughs> club here in Phoenix, and we got together once a month and shared ideas and learned stuff from each other. And then I wanted to share those ideas with others. So I had to write it on a piece of paper, type it. Now, some of the older people, some of the young dentists don't even know what a typewriter is. It's this, you don't even, you don't need to explain. You type it on a piece of typewriter, copy it, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it. I mean, it was very expensive to distribute. Now I do it with a click of a button and it's essentially free. Once I have the infrastructure, it costs me nothing to send it to the entire world. And it's somewhat the same thing with our dental practices. So once you have digital data, you can start doing things very inexpensively compared to what it used to cost us. The, the, the buying the stuff to get started can be costly, but the per transaction cost is virtually nothing. And so when we look at like the, uh, one of my big topics I've been talking about for years and years is paperless records. I went paperless in 2002, you know? And people say, oh my gosh, it's so expensive. No, compared to paper charts, it's cheap. But what happens is when you buy a paper chart, if you go online and buy a paper chart, it costs you uh, $4.40 for the paperwork, just the paper. And then you've got to put in the contents and then you've got to file it and you've got to type the things on it. I mean, it costs you at least five or six bucks per chart. If you've got a couple of thousand patients, we're looking at thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of the expense of your paper chart system, plus those files. I mean, those file cabinets are expensive, you know, if you get the fancy ones. So we have this system, but because it costs us $4 at a time, it's ka-ching, 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 and the, the incremental costs are so small, we don't realize we're spending forty or 50000 you go out and buy yourself a good dental practice management system like Dentrix, that's the one I like. And, and there's other good ones, I should say that. You know, I know there's other good ones, but I love Eaglesoft, but, but Dentrix is my, my practice with the software. So you buy Dentrix, you buy the computers to go in all the rooms, you set up all the networking, you do all the training, and you're just gonna spend 30, 40,000, which seems like, oh my gosh, it's a lot of money, but then you're not spending $4 every time. And the fact is it will pay for itself in a relatively short period of time because you're not spending that money over and over again. Uh, to support a paper system. What percent of dental offices in the United States would you guess are um, paperless, don't have charts? Yeah, I've been asking that question at my seminars for years and starting in 2002. And one of our big buddies, by the way, second most famous dentist in Arizona, uh, Omar Reed, um, talked about going paperless back before the turn of the century, you know, and um, <laughs> we just thought, you know, he was nuts. But so at that time, so when I first started asking the question, you know, I have an audience of a couple hundred, one hand might go up. Now I'm getting it's getting around 10%, which still is not very many. So it's really taken longer than I would have hoped, but it's the topic that everyone wants to know about. You know, they want, how can I go paperless, Larry, to help me do this? What do I need to do? What software I need to do? And so uh, I'm seeing that change. And, but the thing that's even more frustrating, I'm sure you see this in your lectures too, is when people choose to come see me at Chicago or wherever, they've chosen me because they want to know about technology. They're already kind of on the way. It's the ones that don't even want to bother to come see my lecture that really need it the most, you know? So anyway, having said that, I'm thinking we're, we're approaching 10% um, that are paperless, but it's like on everybody's mind. They want to go paperless. I'm surprised you did 2002. Um, I did it um, because of the Y2K. I don't, I, that was 17 years ago. I bet a lot of millennials don't even remember Y2K. They were probably in grammar school. But Y2K was, um, 
the reason, like, uh, Serac, I had Serac 1 in 87, then Serac 2. The reason Serac took so long to get so good is because the components, the chips, the microprocessors were, were slow. And they couldn't write a bunch of extensive software. And so to save software space for the year, they just put um, uh, two digits. Well, when it got to 2000, it'd show up as 1900. And um, so there was a lot of paranoia. I had um, one friend um, that literally thought the grid was going to shut down. And I mean, he got, um, he, you know, he, he, he prepared for, you know, six months with no electricity. But so I went paperless for Y2K. And then three months after Y2K, that's when the market crashed. Because from 94 to 2000, all the S&P 500 was buying computers and switching from mainframes and they were doing everything because they knew because of the Y2K. And then as soon as Y2K or uh, 2000 happened, um, for enterprise, S&P 500 was all fixed up. So there were, the sales just plummeted and then March it just collapsed. Remember that? That was... Uh, yeah, well, there were, th yeah, there were a number of things happening then. The, yeah, the, the, what? the, the internet, the, 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 the dot-com implosion. Yeah, there were a number of things. But yeah, you're right. And well, well, let me answer, in anticipation of that is I had bought myself some protection. I had bought a software program that I laid on there that was supposed to fix it. And, and, and I'd either it wasn't as big a deal or my software worked because I didn't have any problems either. But you're into, when you say the 2002, because here I am, the big, well, besides David O'Dell, I'm the biggest geek in dentistry. And I'd had Dentrix with, the, with electronic records since like 95, and I'd had digital x-ray since like 98, and there was no reason I wasn't paperless. The reason I wasn't paperless is the reason that most dentists are not paperless when I talk to them around the country, and that is because it's inertia. They just don't, they're just afraid of making that change. And here I had, I had everything I needed, but I just was hanging onto those charts. And part of it was, you know, they were my charts, you know, I'm a dentist, I have to have charts. And it was actually a staff member of mine that kind of convinced me not to do it. She goes, Dr. Emmett, why do you have these charts? I said, well, because they're my charts. She goes, you don't need them. I said, oh, yes, I do. No, you don't. So she said, oh, let's try an experiment. We won't pull any charts tomorrow and see what happens. So we didn't. And I needed one. <laughs> I was right. Well, of course I wasn't right. And by the way, the only reason I needed one was because I had a film panoramic x-ray at that time. I had not yet converted to digital pan. And so I had to go back to a film panel because we didn't take those every year. But I had digital x-rays, digital bite wings and everything, digital PAs of every year. I had my records from all that stuff from every year. So I was all ready to go paperless. I just needed a push to do it. And shortly after that, I bought a digital pan and it was never looking back. So the fact is, and I see this all the time, that dentists have what they need to go paperless. And there's, there's two things holding them back, the dentist and the staff. And they're just afraid to make that next step. You know, it's funny because um, Americans truly believe this is the greatest country in the world. I mean, it has... Americans, about the only thing they're number one in is self-esteem. I mean, they do. They just literally think they're the greatest country in the world. And they also really believe they have the best healthcare system in the world. And it's funny because um, um, when you talk, um, you know, most single-payer systems start after World War II. So they're all 50, 60 years old. So the, you really got to look at the last single-payer system, Taiwan, which was just 10 years ago. Because they got to study the whole world. And when they studied the United States, they said, okay, the United States only teaches you what not to do. And we, um, our healthcare costs eighteen percent, and then Switzerland, they said at that time had the best healthcare system at eight percent, and the Taiwanese people, one of the things, um, what you're talking about, um, going all digital, thinks that it would squeeze out thirty percent of the cost because when Grandpa passes out at the grocery store and an ambulance picks him up, they don't know who he is, they don't have his X-rays, they don't know what meds he's on, they take him to a damn hospital, so they start duplicating all these tests. They make horrible wrong decisions. Even um, Garcia of the Grateful Dead, they didn't even know he was a diabetic. And if they would have known he was insulin dependent diabetic, he'd still be playing the guitar. And um, so you're right, once you cover the fixed cost of a paperless system, the addition of one more patient on the, the marginal cost is almost zero. And um, it was, uh, I, I, who knows where healthcare is going, but I can't believe anybody's, um, um, even wondering what we should do when Taiwan did it 10 years ago. Taiwan's entire country has the same outcomes as our Mayo Clinic, Sloan Kettering, Houston, Cleveland Center. So, I mean, they, they, they stole all those ideas and, and it's just cheaper. At the end of the day, everything digital is cheaper. That's true. And that's when you, so your original question is how do you afford it? The fact is that it is cheaper in the long run, but the, but the, you know, the investment is higher. What, and what, you're, what we're talking about here, too, is one of the most, I think, frustrating things about this is, you know, how do you institute change and how do you get people to do it? Because in dentistry, we've had digital records since the turn of the century. Um, 
it's we don't implement it, but we've had the capabilities. The problem is that we are dominated by medicine. I've sat on some of these committees, and they are they're not my thing. I'm just not a good committee person. I can't keep my mouth shut. But you know, on setting standards and how to because a dental record really is should be a subset of a medical record. That's proper. Right. Absolutely. And so, but medicine is so dominated by all these different fa uh, factors. I mean, there's huge, huge money in there compared to dentistry, and huge people with incredible influence, like the Department of Defense, like the insurance companies, like Medicare, like you know uh, the, the the physicians and the hospital associations, and they all have incredible uh, power and money behind them, and they all have differing things that they want. And then what happened when the uh, federal government finally mandated a quote electronic record for medicine? I have not talked to one physician that likes it, and part of it is because it was developed by a committee of bureaucrats. It wasn't developed by what's best for the patient, what's best for the physician, what's best for the results, and it's just been anyway. So, you so, know so what? Which, I, I agree totally with what you. Well, there's two, the there's two issues with what you're saying. One is that that what system is really going to be the one that works, and how who's going to decide it, what's the benefit going to be. Um, but the other one is just fear, because we can't go a day without reading about some hack on the internet, and people are just justifiably worried about having all their personal data on the on, on the cloud someplace in this big database. I think it would be very powerful, yet we don't, it's frightening to have that. I, I would like all my medical record transparency because I'm always getting accused of having facelifts and tummy tucks <laughs> and all this cause that are working and it never, never happened. It's all, it's all around. Yeah, I can see why people would think that. I know, yeah. I know what they think. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but um, yeah, I, I just, I just think that um, it's just so obvious that you would just copy the Taiwan model who copied 20 single payer systems for 20, for 50 years. I mean, those guys studied that. I mean, in, in college, if you didn't know what was going on, wouldn't you just cheat off, cheat off the, the smart Asian kid in the front row? I would on, cheat off you, Howard. On, on his calculus. <laughs> I mean, you're always supposed to cheat off the, the smart Asian kid in the front row during calculus. And um, the Taiwanese just, I mean, they crushed it. They have the best outcomes. And, and uh, like I say, America, it, it's a joke because about 30% of the cost of the healthcare system, and we're at 18%. We passed $3 trillion in the last 12 months. Three trillion bucks in one year for healthcare, and a gazillion people aren't even covered. It's the number one cause of personal bankruptcy. And 30% of it is just administration crap flying around. And then a lot, another big chunk is duplicating of records. I mean, like girls, um, they'll go in, they'll have a bump. And they'll say, well, did you ever have a mammogram? They say, yeah, 10 years ago. They don't even know the, remember the name of the doctor. They, they, they don't even have their records. And, and I mean, it's just crazy. Which leads me to another um, question that a lot of the yuppies are saying. Um, should they have a server and all that stuff? or Because uh, there's some practice management software on the cloud. And uh, if you, uh, you know, Facebook is on the cloud. Google's on the cloud. Um, uh, Twitter's on the cloud. Um, do you think um, Dentrix on the cloud would be better than having the software in a box in your office and have to put up firewalls and you know and all you know all, all that stuff the answer is yes but yes but <laughs> yes but the concept of cloud-based practice management which is not new by the way we talked about the 90s we called it a different thing there we called it uh, i can't remember what we called it anyway um and curve dental has been around for a while and there's another one and, and dentrix does have a, a, a cloud one they call dentrix ascend the the good news is let me back up no, let me go forward. The, the, <laughs> go uh, sideways. Go <laughs> sideways. Here, I'll scoot over sideways to you. So, so cloud-based systems, the advantage is, of course, everyone's using the latest version of it. It's backed up off-site immediately. You can, um, you can access it from any place that you have internet-based services. So you could have a patient call today. You could look up their, their record. When you send them to another office, you could send them on. Well, I mean, that's another thing. Remind me, talk about interoperability. Um, so that's the, those are the advantages of it. The disadvantage is just the, the, the fear that we're giving away that stuff. And I think the, the, the American public is becoming to okay, more okay with that. You know, we put our photographs on iCloud and then it gets hacked. You know, we put our, I don't buy paper books. All my books I buy through Amazon. I don't have a book in my office. They're on the cloud. I own them, but they're in the cloud. So we're getting more comfortable with putting our information on the cloud. I use Dropbox constantly. I've got stuff on the cloud. So we're getting, as a, as a society, we're getting more comfortable with that. But still a lot of dentists are afraid that if that information is not in my closet, that I have lost it. So that's, you gotta come over with that psychology. And, and that's why we don't have a single payer system or mass transit, because when you go to like, um, 
like Japan and Tokyo, where you go to mass transit subway societies, America started with the horse, the individual horse. You farm this 40 acres, this is my land, this is my horse. The horse turned into the car. Um, Americans have never been this kumbaya mass, like I want to sit next to you on the bus and, and healthcare. We know we got each other's back, all for one, one for all. Americans are very independent. And when they see some guy over there sick, they go, yeah, you drink, you smoke. Uh, I, I saw that with oral cancer. You know, oral cancer, um, it, it's never really had, I mean, I, I give you tons of measurements on Dentaltown Media where articles on oral cancer, don't they don't get much action, they don't get much post. And and I think a lot of that even came from, um, it was a judgmental thing because oral cancer used to be, well, who got it? The smoking, drinking guy, you know, you smoked two packs a day for 40 years, what did you think? It was a, kind of a judgmental thing. And April is oral cancer month and I swear, it, it's like the least interesting, interested, talked about thing. How, how many oral cancer companies have you seen in your 40 years come and go? I mean, they just don't get traction. Yeah. The, the dental insurance companies don't don't even cover for an oral cancer screen. Can you imagine a medical um, downstairs? Um, it's, it was the same technology as uh, vaginal and cervical cancer where they stained it with toluidine blue. They looked at it through a scope and medical insurance paid and then companies would come along right here in Phoenix, Arizona. They come out with the toluidine blue rinses, the same lights. It was all the technology for women's um, vaginal cervical screens. And it was the exact same other opening of the mouth and insurance companies wouldn't cover it. Dentists wouldn't buy it. I mean, it's just, uh, and I, I think that came from a lot of uh, judgmental beliefs that it was from smoking and drinking, whereas now it's HPV. So uh, very, very interesting. But you told me to come back to interoperability. Okay, well, let's go back to the cloud thing. Let's kind of wrap that idea up because the because we read all the time about hacks, you know, Target gets hacked, the federal government gets hacked, uh, Anthem gets hacked. So there's this kind of underlying idea that somehow the cloud's unsafe. But the reality is that that data on the server in your closet is much is, is a much higher risk. If you look at the statistics compiled by Health and Human Services about data breaches, Half of the data breaches reported for medical and dental offices are theft. Not theft of data, theft of the computer. So a burglar breaks in and steals that server out of your closet, you are now on the, on the uh, hook for a data breach reportable, which could result in huge fines if you didn't fill out the proper paperwork. The other, they, and then, or they steal a laptop out of the back of your pickup truck. Or, number two, or number the 12% the, the, uh, of, of data breaches are theft. Same kind of thing, not theft of data, theft of the device. Someone steals a thumb drive with all your data out of your thing or you lose a cell phone or something like that. So between those two, almost two thirds, 62% of reportable data breaches if in, in America have been because of loss or theft. So the fact is that the data in your closet is at higher risk than the data in the cloud. The problem with the cloud is that the big, huge ones are all hackers and by the, way, by the way that same data shows that only eight percent of data breaches are hackers which means 90 percent are not eight percent are hackers but those eight percent account for 98 percent of the actual revealed you know, things so if someone broke into your office well not you because you got a lot of patients if someone broke into my office they'd get 3,000 patients okay which is a lot that's reportable but they when they broke into anthem they got 12 million okay so the when they explain break, what anthem is anthem anthem is a healthcare. uh in, 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 in insurance provider that got hacked last year. They're the biggest medical dental health care breach in, on record. So like 12 million, or maybe more than that, I can't remember, millions and millions got breached in. So all of those big ones, the ones that account for most of the actual uh, exposed records are insurance companies. So when we see that, we say, okay, my gosh, the cloud isn't safe because that's where the hacking takes place. But the fact is, that when you send it out to the cloud, they've got things put in place that we couldn't possibly have in our little dental offices in the corner. And even though it looks worse, the fact is it's you're safer doing that using the cloud to get your data out there. Now, back to my, my I'm gonna get back on one of my hobby horses here. So what interoperability is, that's the ability of different software platforms 
to integrate and work with each other and share data and share information, as opposed to proprietary, which means you can only use that data on that system. A great example is CEREC. You know, I love CEREC. I think they've done some wonderful things, but they are totally sealed, closed garden. You cannot, you cannot use, you cannot use my CEREC scanner and take that data and give it to a different company. I can't even take it and give it to a laboratory of my choice. I've got to be their choice. I've even got to use their network to send it in. Okay. Now, if you talk to a CEREC vendor, they say, "Well, that's for your benefit, doctor." And my answer to that is, baloney. It's for their benefit because they keep you captive. But that's only one example, and I shouldn't just pick out CEREC because everybody does it. In fact, what's even there's, there's three Apple systems. Apple does it, right? Oh, yes. well, Apple, yes, like what Apple does, as opposed to what Microsoft did. But even then, you within there, you have these little closed gardens. So, for example, I mentioned Dentrix. I'm a big Dentrix fan. I use it forever. But I can't even transfer information from one Dentrix user to another, which is just ridiculous. So I'm, here I am. I'm a, I'm a fully paperless record office, and I have my practice up in central Phoenix, and I've got all the information on this patient, who they are, their name, their address, their medical history, their, their treatments, their past information, all this stuff, their insurance information. I've got a complete medical chart, and they move down to Ahwatukee, and for some reason, they want to become a patient of Howard Ferran, and Howard Ferran's a Dentrix user. So why can't I simply transfer my chart to, your, to you? You can't. It's just ridiculous. And if you are an EagleSoft user, it's even worse. And if you're an Open Dental user, it's even worse. So now Open Dental, by the way, is the one that kind of tries to get around these things. But the fact is we can't transfer information from chart to chart, which is what, by the way, which is what the national, um, the, what, they, what they were trying to put together with is national standards for medical records so that you could transfer this stuff and it would be available in the cloud for everybody. But they can't transfer it that way. Then the other one is, the next one was digital x-rays. Same thing. You know, I can't use a Schick sensor and get an x-ray using my, um, well, it used to be Trophy. Now it's uh, Care, CareStream software. I can't, if I have a one in one thing, I can't transfer it to another. And I can change it from a with their proprietary image down to a little JPEG image and then store it separately and then transfer it to you and you get it as a JPEG, but you can't import it. I mean, they just make it so difficult. So dental records themselves, digital x-rays, and uh, the most the third one is the 3D imaging, like CEREC and the rest, all very close proprietary systems. As dentists, we've let that happen because we put up with it. If we go to a buyer one of these systems and say, I'm not going to buy your system unless you have an open system that I can share data with, they'll start making those changes. But as long as we support them in this, it's not going to change. Well, E4D owned by Plan Mecca is more open, isn't it, than uh, yeah. Ser Serona? In, those, in, those, in that area, Serona, I mean, and Sarek is the worst. But, and again, I don't want to... I, they've done so many good things. I love what they've done, but they're definitely I know, but, close. but you should say it because, you know, like I've owned Sarek one, two, and three, and you make one comment about Sarek and they're all, you know, emotionally <laughs> wounded. It's like, I've been emotionally wounded. You know, if, if, if I say, if we say something we believe and you're emotionally wounded, wounded, it's you, it's not us. That's why I call this Dentistry Uncensored. And um, I've made a living pissing people off because <laughs> why, why can't you tell what you feel? Like like Dentrix, I mean, I only have one problem with Dentrix, EagleSoft, with all of them, and that is they, um, they don't merge with QuickBooks Online. Right, and they don't merge with each other. QuickBooks was bad enough, they don't merge with each other. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So, and, well, anyway, so, so yeah, so CEREC is definitely the worst. E4D was slightly better. Um, the newest one that I've uh, investigated is the uh, CareStream one, and um, theirs is completely open system. And I think, in, but, but you, you, you know the products that are coming online, there's, you know, not just those three major ones, but there's like the um, three, uh, th uh, three shape and um, there's one from, anyway, there's a whole bunch of different scanners and different systems coming online and uh, uh, trios and anyway. So, so why can't I, as a dentist, choose the best scanner, right. the best software and the best mill? And right now I can't, you know, but it'd be, that's what it should be. You know, or let's say that I choose this scanner and I'm using this software in this mill and then down the road and a newer, better mill comes out or newer, better, easier to use software that I can just replace that component without replacing the whole darn thing. You, um, um, you know, when you, when you walk in these big labs like Glidewell, they, they, they laugh at the milling devices that dentists buy for the money they buy. They, they buy milling machines, you know, 10 times faster for one tenth the cost. And, but that's because they're. You know, like CAD CAM has been around since uh, they, they been, made the tiles for the space shuttle uh, Columbia. And uh, yeah, but they, 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 they don't want you to do that. They don't want you to go buy a nice, amazing scanner for half the price and a different, amazing, you know, uh, Miller and all this stuff. So what, so what technologies, um, so what other technology you want to talk about? You talked about uh, going paperless, barriers to change. What, what, what other technology got you a passion? 
Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit. I want to kind of finish up with talking oh, about some of, the, some, of the, some of the future things because there's just some amazing things coming along. Um, well, just diagnosis. I mean, think about how we diagnose for tooth decay. You take a bit amounts to a sharp stick and you poke a tooth. And is it decayed or is it not decayed? Well, it depends on how hard you poke. It depends on how sharp your stick is. depends on which angle you poke your stick at. And we know it's extremely subjective. And when you do the research, it's frightening how wrong we are. So, but we've been doing that for ever. There are a number of systems which use high-tech devices that'll scan that tooth for you and tell you whether or not there's decay there, starting with back the old, the old Diagnodent from years ago. And it was okay, it was flawed, but it was the first step. And then we're seeing some amazing things to do that so that we can actually do a, use a high-tech device to do a much more sophisticated uh, d d d diagnosis for us, and then we keep a record of it. Let's go back to caries. That's so, that's so obvious to every dentist. So I've got, I've got a patient come in. Howard, he's my patient, and he's come in. And he takes great care of his teeth. He's never had a cavity. hasn't had a cavity since he's been seeing me. And I go up and I poke that upper left second molar, and I kind of think it sticks, but not really. But then I look up in there, and it's maybe a little dark, but you know, Howard's a good patient. I'm not going to fix that tooth, so I poke it. I'm not sure. He comes back in six months. Just by luck, I've got a dull explorer that day. Oh, it's fine this time. Comes back six months later. My hygienist takes a really sharp explorer and says, I think you should check. You know how this goes? And all of a sudden, two years later, I think, okay, Howard, let's open it up. And we get in there and boom. It, because you take such good care of your teeth, the enamel was very strong with the dentins blowing out. It happened to me. So that's what we do with the sharp stick method. If I have a digital method, I can go in there and examine it. The first time it comes up, beep, 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 gives me a 25. On the borderline, Howard's a good patient, I'll wait. He comes back six months later. It doesn't matter how sharp my explorer is. I go beep, 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 and it comes up at 28. I know it's getting worse, I just fix it. Because I have a digital number that I can look at over time and see a change. So it's those things that are the digital devices that are taking physiological measurements of changes in our systems are just exploding, and they're going to totally revolutionize how so, we so do with, dentistry. So, what device? Because when you're saying beep, 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 that was a Diagnodent. Well, Diagnodent came along, and then there was a couple of them was using cameras. There was a SoPro uh, from uh, France, and then um, uh, oh, I forgot the name of it now. There's one out of um, front here in the USA. But the, but the latest one that I think is kind of interesting is the Canary. Have you tried the Canary? Out of Canada. Yeah, and it did Those uses Canadians. Yeah, yeah, the Canadians. It was a couple of smart ones. So they use the uh, and they use laser and heat and that kind of stuff. The science behind it is just amazing. Having said that, it's challenging to use. It's not as easy as I would like it to be. But it shows, it demonstrates the idea, the concept of that using a digital system to make a measurement of a physiological change that we can record and see it at a much higher level of resolution than we can with our old you well, know, if you sharp had to stick pick method. One, if you had to pick one, tell my homies which one you'd buy. Oh boy, I do like the canary a lot because of what the digital information it gives you. I, explain the canary system. So it uses a combination of... I'm going to pull up their website. ...of... Um, different things to measure the physiological change. It uses a laser, it slightly changes the heat of the tooth, and it uses translumination, and, and it actually then creates a, sl a slight, it looks at the chemical change from the, from the heat. What, because it does all those things, it's much more expensive than Diagnodent. We're looking at a, over $10,000, so it's it's The $10,000 machine? Yeah, it's pricey. Um, but it gives you, uh, but all their research shows that they give very accurate readings as to whether or not there's been change. And why I like the canary is it doesn't just say whether or not there's decay. What it, what it really measures, the physiological change it's measuring is change in the density of the enamel. So it can tell you if there's been erosion in the enamel. You know, you know how you get those those white lesions on the side of teeth sometimes. Right. Is it decay? Is it not decay? Does it go in the dentin? Does it not go in the dentin? And we're really kind of diagnostically confused. Well, the canary will tell you exactly how deep it is. It, it penetrates up to five millimeters, so it can actually measure five millimeters deep from the surface of the. So uh, I just uh, went to the canarysystem.com, and look at that beautiful face right there. <laughs> it says, "Check out, <laughs> check out what Larry Emmett is saying about the canary." <laughs> No, no good to you. I mean, everybody's wanted your opinion on new technology since I can remember. I, th I think when I came to this town, 87, you were already... Dr. Larry Emmett here, talking about a fundamental, basic, <laughs> critically important activity. So, so um, yeah, it is. Um, and, and then there's also another simple thing you can think about is um, light, photons. They don't even know what it is, but they, they now know it has gravitational mass because they see... As when light goes in between two galaxies, it bends towards the bigger galaxy. So we, we know a photon has mass, but when you're looking at black, what is black? That means light is flying in there at 186,000 miles a second. It's not coming out. And sometimes you just don't use common sense. I mean, a lot of times, uh, you know, you, you, you're looking at a molar and there's, there's a black hole. And uh, my, my office turns 30 years. I graduated 30 years ago, May 11, 87, and opened up my practice September 21, 87. 
And for 30 years, remember back in the day when you had air abrasion? Yes. So air abrasion, you know, you wouldn't even have to numb until you hit dentin. And when you know, I'd see black, I just start spraying it with that aluminum oxide powder. Was it aluminum titanium? Was it what was it, aluminum oxide? Yeah, I never. And, I, um, yeah, I don't know. If you see black, it it goes to the dentin every single time. I've never seen black in a fissure that didn't go to the dentin. I just haven't seen it in thirty years. So sometimes when you're poking and looking at it, dude, it's black. I mean, if light's flying in there at one hundred eighty six thousand miles a second and none of it's coming out. Something's down there absorbing <laughs> all the damn light. So if it's black, take it out. <laughs> black, take it. Well, yeah. okay. And there, <laughs> and there were some interproximal lights uh, that have come yes. over the air where you just shine a light and talk. And well, the, 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 the original one was called Difodi, which was just an amazing technology. We just used high intensity light, shown it through the interproximal space, and then you would see the, like a transillumination. It would see it on a camera and use software to diagnose it and say whether or not there was decay there. I thought it was revolutionary, and it just never caught on. It was brought back a couple of years ago by the, um, oh, my mind went blank, one of the digital x-ray companies, um, the one that has this, the rounded uh, sensor. The rounded sensor. One of the rounded corner, not sure. No, uh, the, uh, they're one of the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. my, my, well, you know, anyway, they brought it back under a new name, same technology. But it's amazing. So why not use this technology that I can put a shine of bright light between the between the cusp, between the uh, patient's teeth, get an interproximal diagnosis with no dick, with no X-rays? Well, I got a, I got a, you know, one of the more um, sad ways to look at the universe is our America. And, you know, the romantic way is truth, liberty, and justice, the American way. The sad way is money is the answer. What's the question? Look at X-rays. How long had X-rays been out? And it wasn't until 1958 when they started dental insurance. Before Delta, it was the New Jersey, the Longshoremen's dental insurance deal. And they covered 100% of x-rays. So the insurance, as insurance companies came along, when insurance had come to a state, like it came to Kansas, and all the dentists saw that it covers 100% for x-rays, they all bought x-ray machines. So if you look at the history of dentistry in America, it follows reimbursement in healthcare and dentistry back to the oral cancer deal. The reason nobody does the oral cancer deal is because the insurance, I guarantee you, if Delta Dental and Connecticut General and all of them start paying the same fee for an oral cancer exam as they do for um, a cervical pap smear exam downstairs on women, every dentist in America would start would start doing it. Totally, I agree. They'd do it tomorrow. I agree. So if they're not going to get reimbursed, they're, they're not going to do it. And uh, and I, I want to I want to get your insight also on on um, the canary and the, all that stuff. There seems to be a ton of research that says um, half of the sealants fail in a year, and the other half fail in a year too, because you're taking technology where you acid etch enamel, but you're acid etching pits and fissures filled with Oreo cookies and lunch and and all that stuff. And then there's some people like me who think um, I would just if it was my kid when I take microabrasion. Um, or a burr and clean out all the pit and fissure. You hit dead in 100% of the time, and then now it's an occlusal composite. So they're giving me, you know, 50 bucks for a sealant, and I think they all fail quickly. But now you're getting, you know, 150 bucks for an occlusal composite, and five years later, they're pretty much all going to be there. What, what's your view on? on sealant versus preventative resin restoration or occlusion. Yeah, well, you've kind of gotten out of my area of expertise. I don't. Well, well no, uh, yeah. because, because you have expertise in diagnodent. Well, I'll talk, uh, yeah, I will, I will talk about that part of it, too, yeah. because in my practice, I don't see children, thank God. Actually, I don't have a practice. I sold my practice a number of years ago. But when I did, I stopped seeing kids a long time ago. So I kind of stayed out of that area. So my clinical experience doesn't apply. Having said that, one of the things I like about the canary is it actually looks beneath those surfaces. So like the Dagnodent, and I, I love what they did because they were the first out of the box and they did a lot of good things, but it didn't go beneath sealants. It didn't, you couldn't detect decay around alloys. You couldn't detect decay in approximately. The canary does all of those things. So it actually, because it penetrates five millimeters, it can look beneath the sealant and see if there's changes in the, in the enamel. So it does give you that information. So th that was what I like about it. And, and it also gives you a way to consistently look at the same pit and fissure over time. So if I look at it today and my reading is 20, which is healthy, and I come back in a year and it's 20, and it comes back a year and it's 20, I'm fine. But if I start to see some changes there, yeah, I'm getting in there with my air abrasion or whatever and getting it, you know, uh, sealing that thing up. And then I can use my canary after that to make sure that it isn't starting to do, uh, to fail. So that's my answer to that. And again, my I should be cautious with this too because I use the canary 
for just a short period of time on a, on a trial basis after I sold my practice and I was working part time and I was using it to do this. And that's when my experience with this. So I haven't used it year after year after year. But when I did, I was very impressed with what it did and what the so research. So do you have shows. a dental office home now? I do not. I do well, not. My, my office is yours at any time. I got it. Well, thank you. Yeah. If you, you ever need to treat your wife or try uh, a kid or a grandkid or just just um, treat it like it's your own office. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, that is so nice. I appreciate yeah, that. And, uh, and and I've had a lot of dentists on vacation. They called me up and said, my my wife's down here. Her temporary fell off. And I just said, just, it's your office. Go use it. But um, but yeah, if you need, you need a dental home to try something, just, um, um, well, we'd love to have you. So what, what other technologies got you passionate? What, what's got you Well, excited? yeah, before I continue with that, because I want to kind of go back to another thought or idea that relates to all of this stuff that I've just been kind of developing in the last year or so. And like I said, I've been doing this for 40 years and for 20 of that, I've been on this high tech thing and lo watching change and watching how we approach it. Because remember when I started dentistry, we didn't have a computer. We had paper, you know, and pegboards and books. And so as we've seen this change, you know, as the, as the doctors accept it and then the team members accept it or don't accept it, they kind of are, there's this pushback going on all the time. And the, the mental, picture has been that I got my dental practice, my dental business, and I add technology as an outside thing I kind of bring in and lump on the outside of my practice. And, you know, I've got a, I've got a, you know, it's an expensive extra add on and I've got to, you know, my people maybe use it, maybe don't use it. And one of the issues too has been then getting the team members to use this stuff. Years ago, I helped an office in Ohio go paperless, and I'd gone through this whole process, and I'd, I'm a big geek. I thought it was so cool going paperless. And the staff, the, the office manager came to me afterwards, and she goes, Dr. Emmett, that's kind of cool, but no, she didn't say that. She goes, Dr. Emmett, I know you like that stuff, but um, I like pulling charts. I thought, you like pulling charts? And then I started thinking and going, no, no one, I don't think she likes that mindless job, but in the same token, that's how she was connected to the office. When she looked at those charts, that was her relationship or connection to that patient. She had spent years developing a very sophisticated system of creating and managing charts. That's how she added value. And when she saw me coming in here and saying, you don't need a paper chart, you don't need to pull charts every day, you don't need to put charts back, you don't need to look for lost charts, all those benefits just kind of went by her and she just saw herself as no longer being important. So what am I trying to get team members and dentists, but team members to think of now is to look to the future and just, I'm gonna tell them, you. I used to say, don't worry, technology won't take your job. I'm not saying that anymore. I'm saying, yes, you better darn worry. Technology is going to take your job unless, unless you're the one that knows how to do it. If you think that your job as a dental team member is to pick up the phone and answer it and tell people when their appointment is, you're out of, you're out of date. If you think your job is to be able to set up and manage the practice work, the practice website, so the patient, patients can go on the website and find out when their appointment is, you've got a future. You know, if you think your job is to pick up the telephone and call people to remind them of their appointment tomorrow, you're out of date. If you think your job is maybe to understand and set up a reminder system and maintain and, and, and make that reminder system work, that it contacts everybody and you get 100% people coming in. If you think that your job is to use the technology, you're gonna have a job tomorrow, okay? So it's understanding and using this technology and as we look at all the, the workflow, and that's been kind of my focus in the last couple of years of saying, okay, I'm assuming I've now got a digital office. How does that change how I manage my office? Because one of the big mistakes I made early on is I thought I was a pretty good manager. It wasn't as good as I thought I was, but I thought I was a pretty good manager. And I had these systems. And when I brought technology and I wanted technology to support my existing systems, I did not want to have to change. And I realize now what a huge mistake that was. Because once I have a digital system, I can do things different and better and faster and less expensive. And the promise of making technology pay for itself is in fact, you will have less staff people. They're gonna be extremely well-talented people and they're gonna make your practice just hum. But it is going to be, you know, if you don't, if you as a team member don't realize that, if you think your job is to, fan, to shuffle papers and pull charts, you're out of date. If you think your, your, your job is how to maintain and set up and run a, a paperless record, you have a future, okay? So I'm, I've, I read an article of some business journal, Wall Street or something like that recently, and they talked about a business technologist, that the person in the office that knew how to do these things. They were the ones that were gonna be valuable in the future. And it was like a little aha, same thing in dentistry. So if you can be the practice technologist, then you're gonna have a future. If you think your job is answering the phone and filling out forms and, and filing, uh, not so much. You know, one of my um, big things I'm trying to do is get dentists off this, uh, the spending all their money on advertising. When we got out of school, there's no advertising. Then within 10 years, it was 3%. 
Now a lot of offices are 5%, probably 10% of the, the offices are spending 7% of collections on advertising. But you look at their, their office, here's their, here's their, um, you know, their one hygienist and three chairs, and they're, they're, they're pouring 25, 30 new patients into it a month for 40 years. So all the old patients are coming out because their capacity never changed. Their, their revenue is the same. The number of hygienists they have is the same after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And you walk into these guys at 65 years old and say, what do you need? So I need new patients. Like, how, how do you need new patients? And I think the biggest part is the loyalty program. You talked about that receptionist saying that she liked to pull the charts. They don't pull the charts. They'll, they'll call up, they go, um, and, and I, the, the biggest limits test is the dentists who believe in electrosurges. They're, they're, just, they're just clueless. When you electrosurge off the tissue, they're in pain. But they call the office and say, God, the gums, it, it hurts, it's burning. Can I get something for the pain? And the bottom line is they don't put down the phone, go pull the chart, and then come back and enter. Uh, uh, patient Larry Emmett called, he said that gum is really sore and all this. And, and that conversation's all lost. But for loyalty, when you call the office, all you gotta do is type in Larry Emmett. And now two weeks later, the dentist sees the patient and it says, wow, he called in three times because it was hurting. And my receptionist called him in a pain pill or he came by the office and got a prescription for a pain med. All that's lost. And in a relationship, I want to have all those notes. And I and when Dennis would, would tell me, um, well, I use electrosurge. I, I, I've done this at least 10 times. Well, I use electrosurge. I, I've never had anybody in pain. I say this isn't. Who's the last person that you used electrosurge on? They'll say, uh, Mary Jo. I say, okay, well, let, let's call her. Mary Jo, you know, is, is how's your gum? Oh my God, <laughs> it's killing me. But they come in for the crown seat at two weeks and when did it stop hurting? After about 10 days. So 10 days of aching pain and they just thought, well, I had a crown done over here and it was fine, but the doctor did a crown over here and oh my God, for 10 days, I thought I was gonna die. And then they never come back and then you wanna spend all your money on new patients and I want you not to spend three, five, seven percent on advertising and then be addicted to new patients till you're 65. I want you to spend that money on loyalty programs, th things things that keep customers for life. And a digital chart is a big part of keeping yeah. customers for life. Well, thank you, yeah, exactly. Because one of the things that people say, well, if, I, if I'm not pulling charts, if I'm not answering the telephone, if I'm not filling out forms, what am I gonna do? And the answer is that. You're gonna be the human relationship because what you wanna do is take the things that machines do well and let the machines do it and then take the things that humans do well and let humans do that. And that's relationships and that's being a human being. That's de dealing with people, totally. And one of my things I used to talk about all the time when I first started lecturing on this was a high tech, high touch, which means it's the technology is significant, but it's the high touch, it's the human relationships that, that, that create that. So um, I, when, when yeah. you, if I ask you, um, technologies that increase loyalty you know so the dentist says well i don't have the money for technology but he's got a billboard and a direct mail and all this stuff like that but if a dentist was going to move some money from advertising to high touch technology what, what comes to your mind well certainly reminder systems and ways to deal with that but i would say the, the the you can create a system that then allows you to create the personal touch. If you're just gonna rely on a digital system to send out a reminder, that saves you tons of money for a person picking up a telephone and waiting on hold. But if you can then get a list of people that they can actually then personally contact for a personal reason, yeah, I think that's what you wanna be able to do. And there's a number of like dashboards and systems that will help you with- And there's that also kind of um, four different groups of people walking around the United States. I mean, it's easy to say girls, boys, or Chinese and Irish, but, um, the baby boomer, the greatest generation, thinks differently than the baby boomers, the millennials. Um, my dad thought people that use an ATM machine were idiots. He's like, well, why wouldn't you just walk in there? Well, they got, a, they got a lady right there. Why would you go mess around with that stupid machine? But it looks like millennials would rather um, bank online than deal with you. They'd totally. rather make a dental appointment online totally. yep. than even talk to your receptionist, which is kind of foreign to a 54-year-old guy. I'd rather talk to Valerie to make a dental appointment than do not, but millennials are different, yeah, aren't they? Totally, and that, thank you for bringing that up because you're, you're totally right. And so one of the things that I've <coughs> been talking about for years is using the internet effectively and what a dental website should have. Because in our, in our heads, many of us think of a dental website as nothing more than, than a, uh, electronic yellow pages. It's a place to get new patients and it can be very powerful for that. Having said that, a good wet, wet dental web page supports your existing patients. So it's not, and, and many dentists don't even think about that. And the, and the guys, when you go to the shows, you go to Chicago Midwinter or whatever, the dental salesmen are not, the website salesmen are not selling you that. They're selling you, doctor, I'll bring you 40 new patients a month. Um, 
But the fact is that a good web page allows patients to log in. It allows them to do just that. Make a payment. Check when my appointment is. Make another appointment. Check what my balance is. Look at my post office instructions because they edit use electro search. Um, there's things that you know that support your existing patients. Because another thing too, if your if your web page is just to get new patients, that means that your patients have an incentive to go to your web page once in their lifetime. You know, if they can go online and pay their bills, and they and I can't believe that every dental office doesn't allow that. If they can go online to pay their bills. Every patient that owes you money is going to go to your web page. But what percent of there's uh, 211,000 Americans who have a dental license. What percent of those 211,000 could I make it a dental appointment on their website? Well, when, okay, this is one of the things I've also been surveying during my lectures. So again, it's a, it's a biased group because they've chosen to come listen to me. The number one online service that dentists are providing is requests for an appointment. That's not make an appointment, it's requests for an appointment where they can say, I'd like to come in Tuesday at 2.30. Then the office gets the email and they can massage that and they can say, well, 2.30 won't work, how about 3.30? And it, they can make that work. And, I, and, the, and when I talk to offices to do that, they get very good results with that. I think the fact that the patient went online and made that commitment is huge, that they've made another step. So I've been thinking, I'm trying to think the last survey I did this. It's, it's not half, but it's, in the, it's close. It's maybe 40% of offices that, are, that surveyed that come to my lectures say they do that. The to one request that, an appointment, but not an appointment. actually. To booking. make an appointment, virtually none. I've, um, Do you think that's going to change the next five yes. years? Yeah, I think we've resisted it because, you know, well, you know, making appointments in dental offices is very complex. You know, how much time you overlap, who, which patient can be there, which endo, do we have another endo kit, this kind of stuff. You know, is this a, a, a golfing buddy, the doctor, we need to get an extra 10 minutes. Um, so that is very challenging, and the people in the front desk do not want to give up that power. <laughs> Having said that, there are certain other things which are very, lend themselves very well to online. Uh, scheduling hygiene for example most hygiene appointments are the same thing um, new patient exams I think it would be fabulous if I could let a new patient schedule themselves because they have made a commitment to my office they will show up as opposed to oh I'll get around to calling um, and again new patient exams are often they're very much the same thing I used to do them after lunch every day after lunch with new patient because I would have time I would be on time and I'd be fresh um, so you I think we'll see some of those changes I don't think we're going to see complex scheduling but I definitely think we're going to see some routine scheduling of uh, people scheduling themselves. And, and even then, this front desk person still has the option. If they see that Howard's scheduled at 2.30 and you know what, we've got a problem with that because we have an overlap, they can call and tell, ask Howard to come at 3.30. I mean, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's very much in the I, 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 I know the pain in that because I, I remember giving up the pegboard to go to a community. I gotta tell you my first Intel joke. Um, so I gave up the, the, um, the pegboard and it was, uh, I forgot what year, I think it was 87, and I bought a, an Intel machine. You know what the guy said to me at the very end? He said, um, well, he said, this is a 286, th this is all you need, but they just came out with a 386, and if you spend more money and you get the big bad boy box of 386, that'll last you the rest of your life. <laughs> You'll never need anything more powerful than that. How long did that last? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I had a similar thing. I bought a very fancy computer, my very first one in the 80s, I think, and I had a 10 megabyte hard drive. And that was going to last me the rest of my life. And the fact is, I had a multi-doctor practice at that time. We filled it up and had to buy another 10 megabytes for $10,000. I thought, I was, you know, I was just beside myself. I thought what um, <laughs> some of the, the most interesting stats on the internet today is just Netflix. Oh. Um, the Netflix, um, the... Um, you know, we live on the Western Hemisphere, only one billion people live in the Americas. So the other six billion live on the other side. And when Netflix is streaming those uh, movies to the people on the other side of the planet, um, it takes 100% of all um, ocean cables to do it. And they, they've been getting in big trouble with that. So they've had to cache their movies on the other side because they literally would take 100% of all the transatlantic <laughs> and trans-Pacific fiber optic cables just carrying movies that's incredible yeah i mean it's just amazing um video so um and and you know the other thing i always think about is um when i was a freshman at Creighton, 1980 i was on the ninth floor and um uh, there's this mike heilman guy down the hall and me and these four other guys that are now old dentists you know this guy he walked in with a, a, a computer i think it was a tandy from radio shy or something and he was a computer major and he was studying fortran and basics and we were studying you know calculus and and he demoed that and we just said oh my god that's the stupidest idea 
I mean, so I didn't see that coming, the cell phone. I mean, I didn't see any of this technology. And I, I think to myself, like, Zach's 21. And when I was 21, we didn't have any of this stuff. I just wonder what they'll have when Zach is 54 like his dad. I mean, I, I don't even think we can imagine it. Let me give you an imagination. Now, okay. this is my imagination, so it's obviously going to be wrong. Because well, actually, one of my first experiences, the same as you, I thought computers were a pain. I, would, I had one to do my books in my office, but I didn't like it, and I didn't see any future for it. And it was actually my son, who's now, a, 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 in a, hopefully in a few months, will have a PhD in computer science. And his, wow. he said, he was in like second grade, he said, Dad, let's get a computer. And that was, by the way, when the very first Macintosh had been introduced. And I was working with these old stupid things, we, we were worse than DOS. And I got, him, I got him a Mac, and all of a sudden I had a mouse, and I had a clicker, and I had a thing, and it was a total light bulb. I said, yes, I can make, if I had one of these in my dental office, I can revolutionize things. And then shortly thereafter, we started seeing Windows. Windows got introduced within, within a few years of that, and then we, and things did change. So. Having said that, so imagine this future. So in the dental office, a patient comes to see you, and rather than hand them a clipboard with a form or even hand them an iPad with a form, you simply download their health history from the sky, from the cloud, has all the information in there, all the previous dentists they've seen, what their health history is, and not just their dental health history, but their entire medical history, because it's actually been filled up by the physicians that they've seen. It shows you all the drugs they're taking, it shows their allergies. You actually have access to their previous diagnostics. You don't have to worry about some dentist in Maine sending you their x-rays, you've actually, they're on the cloud, so you have them all there. So you actually, before the patient ever walks in, you have all that and of course your software analyzes it and tells you what areas of concern and what things to look at. Patient walks in the door um, after you've got this download. So well, actually before that, before they even then that they take their, their iPhone or their, or their Android and uh, they, so good, they go to their, their dental app, connects it to your office and they actually uh, take some images of their mouth and then they do a special one that actually shines a special light on there that gives you the, the, oral, the oral cancer screening and that's actually going to be all uploaded to you. They also have a little app that goes on their phone when they're brushing and so it actually you can get a, a record of how their brushing has been, what the pH of their saliva is and all that information actually comes to your office through the smartphone, through the cloud, through the uh, uh, Bluetooth. So when you walk into the office, you've already all got that data. You know who they are, what they do, you know what their mouth looks like. So then you come in and you actually then stick a little uh, thing, this thing called S-Ray, just in totally amazing, you put it in their mouth and you bite down and for about 30 to 90 seconds later, it's getting faster every day. It actually takes um, sound waves and analyzes <laughs> those teeth. And actually because sound waves, ultrasonic measures changes in density. So it can actually measure a density difference between a healthy enamel and decayed enamel, difference between enamel and dentin, difference between gingiva and bone, difference between gingiva and air, which means it actually can give you a map of their gingival pockets. So actually within about 30 seconds, you have, well, 90 seconds, you've actually got this little image that pops up on the screen that shows you every tooth. It shows you the different densities of the tooth. It shows you where the decay might be. It shows you where their periodontal pockets might be. It shows you how, how strong their bone is and actually then it, it, you can root, rotate it around you've actually got a three-dimensional um uh, image of their tooth is actually like 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 a study model. So actually, so you do your diagnosis, and then you actually take some software to look at that because the fact is our eyes aren't as good as the software. The software can actually analyze and say, hey, actually, no, this change in density here in the interproximal between three and four, actually that is decay. We need to, to take care of that. So then you actually then will take another instrument. You take a uh, a, a laser driven handpiece and put it in there, and actually you'll take the software from from the will diagnose the machine and put it into this one, and actually then it will microscopically move that. Uh, laser to remove the amount of uh, decay uh, perfectly present and then you won't be actually making a restoration because then you've actually still got a digital image that will then go to your little machine and 3D print out of uh, stem cells that make enamel into an actual little filling that then you will just then place into that tooth and it'll kind of just grow itself in there. So that's kind of what we might be saying when your son is 54. And who will be doing the necessary? Will it be me or will it be R2-D2 and C-3PO? <laughs> It'll be the technologist. So I mentioned how... Well, could that be a droid? <laughs> um, you know, you could be doing here in Arizona. Of course, why wouldn't you want to live in Arizona? Well, I know why. June, July, and August. But the rest of the time, <laughs> we want to live in Arizona. But you could actually have a patient you could do that exact same thing with in South Dakota. So this South Dakota patient can send you all that information electronically. You're sitting here in your office in Arizona. They actually would, all the, the uh, software analysis, all that kind of stuff could be done in the cloud. You would see it here in Arizona. You would send the diagnosis. Actually, we're doing, uh, they're already doing robot-assisted surgery in medicine where um, there is a physician, a surgeon, actually you manipulating the machine, but he's doing it in like, a little, like a little joystick, and the surgical device on the patient is actually then in microscopic levels doing the laser or whatever to change it. So you could really be here in Arizona doing a gravity prep on a patient in South Dakota, 
Then the only thing that would physically have to be there would be the restoration. So there'd have to be a 3D printing machine where he was, or some sort of rapid way to get it there. Maybe you could 3D print it here and and you and 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 then Uber it to him or whatever. But there would have to be physically the restoration has to be where the patient is, and nothing else has to be where the where where, where the patient is. You could literally do it teledentistry from around the world. Were you born and raised in Phoenix? I was born in Canada. I am an alien. I am a migrant. And then my parents came to Canada when I was a child. So I grew up, I mean, from Canada to the because, U.S. when I was a child. So I grew up you, here. Because when people say, how do you live in Arizona in this June, July, and August when it's 110? Are you out of your mind? I was born and raised in Kansas. The um, the most beautiful thing about the desert is there's no insects and mosquitoes oh, and flies and sure. chairs. And when I go back home and I go sit out, you go to a picnic, you sit by the lake. I, um, we, we, we just came back from camp. We looked like we had chicken pox. Uh, my boys, I could not believe it. We, I lectured in Belize, and uh, I took my uh, three of my boys there. And I mean, I mean, we literally looked, I mean, we were eaten alive. And we were putting illegal 100% DDT, which, you know, in the United States, that's not even legal. Uh, same thing, Minneapolis, uh, um, Minnesota has, uh, what, 10,000 lakes? And Alaska. In Alaska, I mean, there's swarms of mosquitoes. And I, to sit out in my backyard, I could go sit out. Sure, it's 110 degrees, but I'm not getting eaten alive, and there's no humidity. That's true. The, the, the dry heat part is true up to about 100. Then it gets a little warm. But, yeah, same thing. Where I, grew up, where I was born in southern Ontario, we had incredible mosquitoes come up off of the, of the Great Lakes. And I'll yeah, take 10 yeah. extra degrees and no. And then I go, I go to, I'm... I'm not kidding. In, in Florida, you'll, you'll go to a dentist's house and you'll go sit on the patio. It's completely screened in just yep. because of the bugs. Oh, yeah. No, I, um, yeah. I, I want to I wanna say, remember yeah. how I was talking about how the greatest generation thinks different than the baby boomers and the millennials and all that? A lot of these millennials, um, they, they, they all grew up on Macs and apples. Um, what would you say to a young kid getting out of school, 25, saying, I don't want to get a, a Dell and a PC and I, I don't want to get all that Microsoft. I, what, what type of software... Um, you say you yeah. like Dentrix. Well, what, what if you were an addict to a Mac? The, like I said, I started off my computer life with Macintosh, and I think they have Mac does incredible things. Yes, you just have to realize that if you're going to go all Mac, you're going to pay more, and you're going to be limited. Having said that, if you're willing to do that, you've got some great opportunities. The, there's no great Macintosh-based dental software. There's some, there's some decent stuff. Um, but all the best programs are either are on the are, 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 are Windows based. So you kind of you guess have to make those choices. But to, to answer your question, really, if I was a 25 year old getting out of dental school now and I was going to start my own practice, I would seriously look at a cloud based system because I do think that's the future. Now, when you asked me earlier and I said cloud, I said yes, but and part of the but was the, the reluctance that people have to use it. But the other but is those uh, cloud programs are not as robust. You know, Dentrix has been around for 20 years and they've developed the program and they've refined it and they just do a lot of things which you can't simply can't get on a cloud-based system yet. Having said that, they're getting better all the time. So um, rather than invest in either Mac or PC, I would invest in cloud, then I can use whatever hardware I want and I don't have to worry about whether or not it's compatible. So. And, and so much of that high-tech stuff comes out of Provo, Utah. I mean, that's where Dentrix was born, that's Curve. There's like... What other yeah. companies? There's like six dental companies. Uh, Solution Reach, which used to be Small Reminders, they're out of there. I just talked to a new one. Oh, I wish I remember their name. They do a, a really some interesting new things with. Uh, I think it's called Dental Chats, where they, you know, they provide an online chat service. That's a new one I just looked at. I can't remember. There's another one out of Utah that I think is amazing. So Dent Dental with, Intel. There's a. I'm not familiar with that one. It could be. Yeah, but there's. Well, that. But that whole. There's a whole little uh, corridor there from Salt Lake down to Pro Provo. They call the high tech corridor, and there's a lot. Oh, of, really? uh, Yeah, a lot of high tech companies out of there. Yeah. Yeah, and there's there's six major dental companies in the, in that area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They've done a lot, did a lot of good things. I wonder if that was because that's where Gordon Christian lives. That's like <laughs> he's like the god of dentistry. Maybe his godly energy spawned all those companies. Um, so, um, when, when you were talking about, um, making appointments online on a website, what, what if a young kid said, well, what do you do? Do you have any names of any companies that you think? Might you know, be? I do, and I didn't write them down and they're not, they're not in my head, but there's a, there's two or three that have just started doing that. And they're really having a tough time getting much traction because of the resistance that dentists have, but I know they're out there. Could you, to go could to my you email me those three and I'll put that. them in the notes of the podcast? Yeah. But so when is this going to be broadcast by the way? Um, uh, it's totally up to, uh, Zach. I think we, we, use, I, I, I Usually a week. Okay. Because um, I like and, to do a little promo. Yeah, we have to, we'll talk to Zach. He films it, edits it, okay. releases it, all that kind okay. of stuff. Okay, so there'll be some editing. Um, well, well, 
I mean, you know, the beginning, the end. I mean, um, yeah. Well, you, you talked to Zach and Ryan before um, they do that, but um, yeah. But um, back back to your books. Um, do you? Uh, I, I'd like to push those out on my social media. Do, are, do you still recommend your your books, or are they? Well, the three books were going paperless, which is still very relevant. The second book was choosing digital X-rays, which is I sold a lot years ago. I don't sell very many of those now. And the third book was on where to put computers in the treatment rooms. Are and those again, all on your website? Right, those are all on my websites. Which is what so I was going to say too. If we the if you go to the website, uh, I have lots of listings in the blog over time. It's kind of like Dental Town. There are there are archives of the information. People can go back and get that. So the um, uh, amazontechnology.com is the blog and that's where all the archives and information is about the different softwares like the online uh, software to, to get your appointments that kind of stuff so I'm added to that all the time so there's all all kinds of new things there um, so so now are, are you talking about buying a hard copy of these books is it a digital copy is it a blog you read on your deal T so, talk about your books the well the blog I started writing ages ago and it's evolved as we've gotten better at that and then the books were written based on my lectures and my magazine articles because you know I wrote for all the magazines for years before I, I went to strictly online and um, so are you still writing for any magazines not regularly I could but it's too much effort <laughs> too much effort <laughs> that uh, so uh, having said that yeah I would love to give some articles for dental town I still submit some articles here and there but would, would your magazines. books be under the uh, technology guides the high tech and so where, where yeah, are your books on the guides high technology guides that's the books okay so the technology guides okay so going paperless so that's a um and then you have digital radiography and they have computers in the treatment rooms right Expert business strategies. That one was so published have, by the ADA. So you have four books then. Yeah, well, the ADA. Yeah, I, 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 have, I have a chapter in that last book, and um, so, um, so you have four books: Going Paperless, Digital Radiography, Computers in the Treatment Rooms, and Expert Business Strategies. Correct. And you can buy all four books for the price of one. No. Oh, because okay. one is sold by the ADA, so I gotta <laughs> let them sell that one. The other three I'll sell as a package. Yeah. Okay, and. Um, so did you want to go through each one of those four books? Well, the first, well, the, 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 the two are a little out of date and I still have them available because I sell occasional copies. I sold a lot of them years ago, which is digital radiography and where to put the computers. Because you got to remember, Howard, when we started doing this, we didn't have computers in the treatment rooms. Nobody knew where to put them. And there were all kinds of confusion, you know. So I did a lot of research on that, a lot of experiment in my own office of where to put these things. It's well established now. But nevertheless, I do find some doctors that are going to remodel and they're not sure and they, they still look at that book. But I don't, that one's not as, uh, as, as when I first wrote it, it was very uh, timely. Same thing with digital radiography. It's interesting. Uh, it took a long time for it to go and it finally hit the tipping point. And most dentists now have it. But for a long time, they were just so on the fence, they couldn't make up their mind. And so that book's for those people. But the paperless records book is still very timely. So people are just on the fence. They want to make that choice and to go paperless. And this will tell them why they go paperless, how to do it, how to set it up, what pitfalls to avoid, how, the, how much to budget, all that kind of stuff. So that book is definitely the one that I've sold the most copies of and still you, very topical. You know, when you talk about setting up a dreamer room, do you, do you know the most, um, the 400-pound uh, uh, or the 4,000-pound elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about, but it's really a huge issue, is 11% <clears throat> of these 6,000 graduates are left-handed. And there's a lot of very upset dental students when they go into work as an associate and you find out it's a lefty. And the dentist just said, well, we, we, we only do right-handed. And some of the dentists, I mean, and I mean, the lady sent me a message yesterday uh, on LinkedIn and she said, he emailed me back. He said, I'm not hiring a lefty. She goes, my sister's a lawyer. And she goes, I, I don't think that's even legal. Um, <laughs> I so, don't think left hand is, is a constitutional protected right. Having said that, yeah, it's a challenge. But, but it's, um, you, um, look, like say you go to sell your practice and you have a buyer, but he's a lefty. What, what would you, what, what do, do you think every dental office should set up to Boy, accommodate a, a left-handed hygienist? I got to tell you, I was dentist? one of those bad guys. I mean, Basically, when I was building my offices, I said, you know what, we can't have left-handers. It was just, it was a, it was a choice. And then that wouldn't be a legal issue. No. If, if I said I'm not going to hire you because you're left-handed, it's not. You know, there's. It's not a covered. Yes, yeah, not law. a covered thing. You can huh. hire. You can not hire because you're a smoker. That's not covered either. You know, so there's certain things. But having said that, I think I don't think that's necessarily a good choice. Um, and there are ways to get around that. But yeah, that's not an area that I have a lot of expertise in. But, um, but where to put the computers, and the fact is the systems that we did eventually design to use computers would certainly accommodate both right and left-handed people. Um, 
by, you know, where we put them in. Because again, we went through all kinds of things and made a lot of mistakes on what to do that, where to put them. So that book was a result of that. Nice. Uh, so, uh, my God, that was the uh, the fastest hour. I can't believe uh, we're uh, way over an hour. Um, um, any, before I let you go, any, anything else uh, passionate that you want to talk well, about? Well, we talked in the beginning about mountain biking, and that, that's my fun job. So for about 10 years, I've been putting on this, kind of this CE program where people, a dentist can come and go mountain biking. And right. is it once a year? Yes. And on your, and on your website, where is that? It's on called your... Technology on the Rocks. So it's a separate website? Um, it has yeah, it has a separate sign up website there. I'd have to know where the link was going to be. But if yeah, is there can... a link to it on drlarryemmett.com? There should be. I'm not sure where to find it. Let me just talk about that. So we so so we go to Sedona, and if you haven't been to Sedona, it's like one of the most well, beautiful well, places well, in the what's, world. What's the name of, of the website for this this course? You just have to. Or, you know what you're going to have to do is um, uh, as it's complicated. It's too com more complicated than it needs to be. It's just we'll uh, Google technology on the rocks, and what I'll do is I'll send you the link to technology. On the rocks. Yeah. On the rocks. Because I'm doing, I'm sharing it this year with a, um, a a fellow from Chicago, a marketing guy, and he set up the website this year. So I didn't have the, um, I don't have the URL on the tip of my tongue. But essentially, it's like a CE course for you. Yeah. So it's a, it's a three-day adventure CE course in Sedona, Arizona. And if you've never been there, it's just this amazing place. And the main event is mountain biking. So we'll take the dentists and uh, staff, staff members and their dentist spouses and friends out mountain biking in the morning. If you survive, we have a seminar in the afternoon. So it's to do that legally with the, with the uh, CE, with the... Um, uh, IRS, you have to have them, with the IRS will say the majority of the day. That's usually interpreted four hours. So we have four hours of seminar in the afternoon. So for three days, you get 12 CE credits, all about the things we've talked about today, like going paperless and using Google and, and HIPAA requirements and future dentistry and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and, it's, and it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. So it's coming up in about a month, May 18th to 20th in Sedona. And is the website emmettontechnology.com? That's my blog. Oh, that's your blog. Yep. So, so what's the difference between drlarryemmett.com and emmettontechnology.com? So drlarryemmett.com is where I sell the books and sell myself as a speaker. It's really more for meeting planners and people that want to buy books and consulting. And Emmett on, and, uh, Emmett on Technology is the blog. So I add to it every day. There's articles on there. There's links to the companies that I've worked with, links to products that I think are cool, to links to articles which I think are interesting, that kind of stuff. So it's more of an everyday you, thing. You know, um, and I, I've seen you lecture like three times uh, um, getting my FAGD, MAGD. I, I think you're an amazing speaker. Oh, thank you. Uh, you're a very natural speaker. Um, and I also want to tell you, you know, you know, if I wanted to go to Hollywood and be a movie star, I'd have a demo tape. Um, you know, you, 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 you have a tape. You know what the biggest, if you want to speak more, you know what the biggest demo tape is? So there's like 278 counties that hire speakers. And they're, you know, they're not-for-profit dental associations and, and they'll, they, they need three guys uh, to, to pick speakers for the next meeting. Uh, the number one meeting um, complaint is there is nothing for the staff. Um, so they always, that's why you always have a practice manager course. And then they'll be like endo and a perio. So they'll say, okay, you go get a perio, something on perio, you get something on endo and you get something for the whole staff, which is usually practice management. And these, um, these guys, we, we put up like 300 online CE courses on dental town. And I mean, they're, they're coming up on like, um, three quarters of a million views and they go to, uh, so I'm supposed to get endo speaker. So I go to dental town. There's like six courses, six one hour course on endo. And I, I watch all six and say, I'm gonna get that guy. And then I'm the, the introvert dweeb dentist. I'm supposed to get something for the whole staff. So I go to practice management. And, but almost everybody that puts up an online CE course, I had one guy put up an endo course and he booked 78 invitationals the first year to speak. So if you, uh, so if you put a, a one hour core online course on dental town, then to townies all around the counties will, will, will see you and say, yeah, that'll be good. Because it is the number one complaint. There's nothing for the staff. And I think the staff, I mean, you're oh, perfect my for the staff. Yeah, my staff kind of my yeah. problem all the and time. And that's the, that is the number one sought after um, speaker to, to uh, settle. The number one sought after complaint was my spouse and assistants and hygienists. I mean, they don't, oh, they don't want to go to endo lecture. Bone no, grafting yeah. and root canals. So. 
So, so, uh, so you're telling me I should put a course on dental tech? You should put an online course, you know, and, and I uh, never had an original idea in my life. And um, we're here in Phoenix with Phoenix Online. So I, um, we, University of Phoenix. Yeah. And so I would drive to the airport. I'd see, first it was one little building, University of Phoenix. Then it was two. And they just kept adding buildings. <laughs> I know, so, they're huge. <laughs> so finally by 2004, um, we started putting up these courses. And what's amazing is that we can tell if they're watching these on desktop or on the Apple. Yeah. And basically what the millennials say is you see have this big screen TV, but they say, take your iPhone and pull it in until you can't see the big screen TV. And it's right here. And they just sit there and they, they, they take these on their, their phone, their iPhones. Whereas you and I always went to a, a bricks and mortar convention building yeah. and signed in and registered and all that stuff. And um, these are the, these online CE courses have just exploded. Good. I will do that. Yeah, and, and totally. you also look at the attendance of all the major meetings. They've all all the oh, major yeah. meetings attendance been drifting downward, and they always say, "Well, I wonder where they're all going." They're going on. I, I, I we had a dentist on here that you might know, Jared Pope from Maricopa, one of my favorite dentists in town. He completely learned placing implants and bone grafting just on YouTube. He would just go to YouTube and type in surgical placement. And he said he said you could watch one million hours of how to place implants just on YouTube. And he'd rather do that at home with his kids than go to a convention. Yep, I totally, I, I totally agree. Well, I think there's a different experience going live and being just like the different experience going live to the Final Four tonight than is gonna be watching it on That's right. Final Four just down the street. And Are you then, going? No, but I'm gonna watch it on television probably. That's a different experience. But having said that, that doesn't mean the television experience isn't a good one. And I totally agree with you that, uh, that online learning is, is huge. See, I could, go, I could go to the uh, Final Four. Um, what, what I can't go to is a Cardinals football game because I am such <laughs> a fanatic. I mean, I'm obsessed with the Cardinals. It's my stupid thing. And uh, I want to hear the commentators. I want to hear the instant replays. Yeah. And to go to a game with no instant replays, no commentator. But basketball you take is your just phone kind and of. You a, watch it as you're there. Kyle. Really? You can do that. Yeah. You can watch. <laughs> but like, but something I'm not serious about, like basketball or hockey or whatever. And then it's fun to go get a beer. Yeah. And a hot dog the with atmosphere. Your it's a different. Yeah. It's a different yeah. experience. It's not one's not. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but they're different experiences. Thank goodness we still have live meetings. That's why I make most of my money. But having said that, yeah, I think I'll do the online stuff for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, it, um, it, it, it's just a different, a live meeting is just a different genre. Yeah. It's fun to go with your staff. It's fun to see all the vendors. Right. Meet with people. Meet yeah. people. Just a different, yeah, different yeah. experience. It's, it's yeah. a, it's fair, uh, yeah. But uh, Larry, seriously, um, thank you so much for coming over to the house and letting oh, thank me and you. Zach and Ryan uh, tape you. Been a big fan of yours for 30 years. Um, yeah. And like I say, when did you start speaking? What year? Yeah, it's been yeah, it's been about thirty years ago. It's in mid yeah. early the early nineties when Windows came about, and I, I had my big aha moment that we can we can make this work. And and, and um, Dentrix um, rode that Microsoft Windows wave. I, yes. I think they they were the first system to actually base it on real Windows ninety five. Yep. Whereas like Softent and all those systems before that were DOS systems. And they tried to make it look like it was a Windows deal, but it yeah. didn't have the yeah, Windows you're right. function. Yeah, exactly. Right. But yeah, when uh, I saw you, uh, like saying, I think I saw you lecture um, at least three, at least three times. I can I can remember. But uh, been your biggest fan. Thanks for coming down. Thank you so much.